All right, what's up, guys? We're live hey. on Facebook. How are you good guys? Morning. Doing? Uh, good morning. Good evening. Hey, <laughs> hey, Rich, David, how are you? Doing well. How are you, man? I feel like it's kind of morning. It's been uh, a couple of days. I've been trying to catch up from uh, our interview. It's just been. Yeah, it uh, was morning. It was morning when we interviewed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> For sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, that's joining us. Uh, let, 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 let some folks kind of trickle in. As per usual, those of you that are listening to us later on, we have an amazing show for you to listen, maybe on your commute, if you're doing it via the just the audio version of it, or if you're just doing it, uh, if you're watching it later as well. Thank you always. Um, David, you good there? Is there a yeah, fine? sorry, man. There's a gnat all of a sudden. There's a gnat all of a sudden. <laughs> it's okay. Forgive me, guys. I'm sorry. So we, you know, there, there's a, you know, there's obviously a lot of pertinent things that we want to go over, but most importantly, we want to show you what we did a few days ago, right? Which was a, an amazing, amazing uh, time spent uh, talking, uh, uh, less so interviewing, just getting to know and understanding the experience of Emil Giesen, somebody that if you're on Instagram, you would have known exactly who this person is. Rich is going to queue up some of his projects and what, what, uh, how to, uh, how to kind of see what we're about to uh, show, but we had, an, that was an amazing show. And uh, I think you will like it as well once you hear the final product. Um, David, thank you for, uh, you know, bringing this up. Richard, thank you for producing this. This is really something that I really enjoyed uh, doing. And we want to do things like this moving forward more and more and more. Yeah, no, he was, it was a hard hitting interview. That's literally what it was. And he was super gracious with this time, Emil, and grateful to, uh, for him to be a friend of the show now. So thank you, yeah, Rich. Yeah, for sure. You know, like when you guys first started Odd Arch Media in earnest, you know, during the first four day war, uh, you know, the idea was, if I were, if I could speak for you guys br briefly, it was to, to, to bring a sense of community and connect people to what was going on, because there was a lot happening in real time. And, and when the three of us started doing this most recently, it was with that same sense of energy of like, how do we bring whatever's going on in the rest of the world and in, in, in our homeland specifically, how do we bring it to the people in the right way? Uh, and this man was actually there. And so I think, you know, it really, to me at least, it showed uh, a, a different side of this whole experience. Uh, and I found it really confirmational about a lot of stuff that we were trying to, 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 to show and we were trying to figure out. Um, why was this happening? This didn't make sense. And he connected a lot of dots that I think uh, were really necessary for us to connect with. So uh, I found it to be a really, I, I was keyed up until 3 a.m. Like I couldn't. Yeah, I, I couldn't. was wired as well, man. I was wired as yeah, well. We had to, obviously, what, what David and Richard are talking about is we had to stay up all night. Uh, you know, at a, we had to tape this at a, at a, a later time during the day yeah. because Emil, obviously, being from the UK, uh, he was on UK time and there was a little bit of a time thing that we could yeah. not have done, done it live. Um, and it's yeah, not very hour, well. Um, yeah, eight hour yeah. difference. We interviewed him at midnight our time. We're up with him till after one. Yeah. yeah. So let's get so, some housekeeping stuff out of the way on this. Uh, we've got, uh, we've, the interview is about an hour. We really hope you'll stay with us. Uh, we, we really hope that you'll get as much out of this, if not more than we did, because we were so in the middle of it with him. Um, there's a lot that we talk, talk about. We cover a lot of ground. But it really is in line with a lot of the interview with a lot of the news that we've been bringing you over the past few months. Um, after that, what we're hoping to do is to cue back to our normal, uh, you know, show where we actually di dissect the news. And there's a lot to cover. We've got everything from uh, the current POW situation. We've got the 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 dismantling of our our, our this cathedral, and I. I, I'm I'm almost broken up just to talk talk about it. So I'm gonna let that sit for a minute. Um, the destruction of sites in Hadrut. Uh, we've got uh, a huge one in this country of uh, Section 907 be, being waived by by the Biden administration. Which, if you don't know anything about it, we'll talk about it and we'll we'll unpack it for you because it's huge. I mean, it's great that we got the high of the genocide recognition, but it's almost a gut punch to know that they're going to be funding it. Uh, uh, the additional, uh, the U.S. government is funding essentially the continuation of that genocide. Um, and then we've got news about Pashinian and, um, and, and more. So there's a lot to talk about afterwards, but do, uh, do, do we want to show um, the, okay. the web, the website? Yes. So this is, yes. yeah, obviously. So this is Emil Gessen, uh, Gessen as he pronounces it, obviously. Um, and let's see here, sorry. Yeah, here we are. Um, yeah, this is a, uh, this is this is the man. Um, that's his website. Uh, the documentary will be a full feature uh, film. 
Um, he, this is his third documentary from what I understand. He also did something in uh, Syria where he followed these essentially volunteers that went after Al Qaeda. Um, and he was, uh, you know, he utilizing his background in, uh, in military. He used to be a Royal, uh, Royal Marine, I believe. Right. Yeah. For 12 uh, years. For 12 years yeah, Royal yeah. Marine. Yeah, Royal British Marine, um, and he had multiple tours in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. So he has that, uh, you know, that side of him is very kind of important in understanding very hot, you know, uh, areas, conflict zones. So he had the Robin Hood complex. Uh, I believe the Robin Hood complex is actually about the the war, the forgotten war in Ukraine, and then there's the Robin Hood complex two. I think they're both named the same was about uh, uh yeah. him following he, he touches uh, on a little bit yeah he touches on it yeah little and bit. he touches on it okay yeah. i'm gonna stay out of it and then yeah, uh, there's okay. a, yeah <laughs> sorry guys no uh, that's and okay, then that's obvious, good. yeah and there's obviously thank you and there's always obviously the uh the um the actual 45, 45 days 45 days uh, fight, fight for, for a nation. nation yeah um matter of fact we can just play the trailer right now yeah. Play the trailer. Yes, yeah, it, yeah, it's from the YouTube only. Uh, for some reason, it's not working on his website. There you go. Artsakhi hara petutsune yen tarkvele Azerbaijanakan zimvat ujeri agresay. Fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan has continued. Nagorno-Karabakh sits within the national boundaries of Azerbaijan, but is populated by Armenians and run practically as its own country. Fighting between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. For 18, 19 years, sons fighting against Turkish special troops, against ISIS from Syria. Any Western leader, they could have ended this war in two days, but they weren't willing to do that. Whether we live or die doesn't matter. Not all lives are equal, and our lives don't matter. And we've learned that. didn't spill so much blood just to give it up in a lash. Still a massive amount of confusion on what is actually going on here. It's confusing to know if we won or lost. Putin announced that just short of 2,000 Russian peacekeeping and troops will be heading in to replace Armenian soldiers. People actually thought we were going to win this war, and we were not going to win this war the way it went. Not easy to burn the oven. Drones, cannons, you name it, they were just constantly coming. Wow. Yeah, this was... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's a powerful film, powerful film. And we're very fortunate for the work Emil has done on our behalf, telling our story, the Armenian story from the front line. And, he, and you'll hear, he's going to mention in the interview, uh, it's a human story he's telling that's for the world to see. It's not just about Armenians. It's meant for the world to see. So, um, and we'll share the link to the trailer as well in the, in the comments. Um, and yeah, shall we... Uh, Give it a shot. Play the. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Support his GoFundMe. The link is there. Good morning, Emil. Uh, we're joined by a special guest, Emil Giesen. Um, he is a conflict documentary filmmaker. Um, he's a past British Royal Marine. Um, and he was on the front lines in Artsakh covering the war from the Armenian soldiers' perspective. Um, we are 
very, we are so indebted to you for your work, Emil. Welcome to Arach Media. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, early, fairly early morning for you, UK time, late night for us here in San Francisco. Uh, but thank you so much for being here with oh, us. You're welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, welcome to the show. Yeah. Appreciate you Cheers, being Frank. here. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, obviously anyone that's been on Instagram has seen your work, has seen you cover, has seen you talk about everything, has seen other friends of ours that are kind of from the area doing fundraising stuff out there in Armenia. So, you know, if you're on Instagram, you've seen Emil, but uh, we kind of want to dive deeper into your experience and kind of show our audience what went into making this film. What did you witness? And uh, Richard, I'll queue up to you. Yeah, so the first question uh, is, tell us a little bit about your background, specifically with uh, the British Royal Marines. Yeah, so I joined um, the Royal Marine Commandos at the age of 18, in the year 2000. Uh, my, my father is a Syrian, Christian Syrian, he came to the UK in the, in the 70s. My mother cover has seen you talk about it. Um, and yeah, I just wanted the life of a, a, adventure and then joined the military. And then very quickly, 9-11 um, happened in 2001. And that changed the way we f we were going, the British military and American military were going to go to war. And I remember one of my sergeants, I was on the shooting range when 9-11 happened, and he said, we're going to war with for this. So everyone's like, yeah, whatever, we're going out drinking tonight, thinking like it's just <laughs> norm. And then very quickly, we will come jumping out of helicopters in the mountains of Afghanistan, hunting Bin Laden, um, trying to shut down the Taliban and Al-Qaeda training camps. So, yeah, so we've done... I've done three tours of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, and then we've done support of Libya in 2011. So then I left the military in 2012. I, I've done 12 years, and I thought it's time to go. There's only so many wars you could be involved in. Knowing that I knew that war was winding down because the public opinion was dropping before the war in Afghanistan. So I left and then went into the private security industry where I was doing bodyguarding work, um, as well as anti-piracy work for the, against protecting shipping against Somali pirates. And then I just had this crazy idea when I met a guy who was going out to fight with the Kurds in northern Iraq and Syria against Islamic State, Dash. Um, he was a British sailor. And I just met him and I found out there's a group of them, Americans and Brits, that were going out to fight as a clandestine mercenary group for free. Um, so I spoke to a few TV companies. I said, who who wants to come in and make this documentary? That, the fact is, i um, got family living in Syria. I've got the skills, I'm a war marine commander, but I don't want to go fight. But these guys do. Let's make a documentary on it. And they were very keen. And then a couple of days before we're supposed to go, they pulled a the plug. This is too dangerous. Uh, we don't know what access we're going to get. So I just went on eBay, bought myself a camera and then booked a flight. And then for a year and a half, two years, I was going back and forth to Iraq and Syria, just making my first documentary, Robin Hood Complex, the fight against Islamic State. And then that's really where it started um, from. And then... After my first documentary, I then went to film school for a year um, and then made the second documentary, Robin Hood Complex, um, Europe's Forgotten War on the war in Ukraine. And then what happened with, between Azerbaijan and Armenia popped up and then, and this is where we are now, currently working on my third feature documentary. That's amazing. Like I, I, I could probably ask you a hundred questions and not get bored. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind, to just to backtrack a little bit is, you know, my father was from Syria also. He was mm, born okay. in Aleppo, as were as were many Armenians. Uh, yeah. were, were, once the first genocide, the beginnings of the genocide happened, they ended up in Aleppo, or or you know, uh, and so you know, I have a particular kinship to the Syrians, and and in fact, my father before he, a couple little points, uh, my father's father literally told him, "Don't come back here until there's peace." Thankfully, <laughs> he, you know, you know, uh, my my father, uh, you know, listened and. He actually went back to Syria and passed away within months before war broke out. So, uh, you know, I'm just grateful he didn't get to see Aleppo leveled. Um, mm. and so, you know, to, to to have you as an eyewitness to many of the things that were there uh, is is pretty profound for me. So I just, you know, wanted to, mm. to say that. So, you know, so what did you how did you find out about what was going on in Artsakh and and the, the, the conflict that was developing and what led you to? To go investigate yeah so obviously covid was happening there was a lockdown going on i was so i was doing work for private companies and filming like uh, editing work as, as i do and then the war started during the news flashes on bbc for example or sky news and it was just it was literally a war going on between azerbaijan and armenia and then i 
I have a bit of a following. People were messaging me and saying, oh, are you going out to cover this latest war? And I was like looking into it and I thought, looking at the 2016 war that lasted four days, I was thinking, well, time I get there. Yeah. yeah, is it going to be worth it? Everything I do is totally independent, self-funded or donations. So to start every project, I always self-fund it until we get the ball rolling momentum for people to support it, if people do want to support. So I just thought, is it really worth the investment? Um, it's been tough times with COVID. Um, and then I looked into it and then about a week into the war and I was watching the social, the, the mainstream media slowed down on what they were they saying, but social media was going wild. Right. And we could, see the, we could see the drone footage, the Zeri's PR campaign was massive. Um, and I just thought, this looks really interesting now. It's a different kind of war that I haven't seen before with the, the drones. Um, so I just bit the bullet, put my hand in my pocket, uh, put the flight. And then I, for this one, for this project, same as my other projects, is just try to make a contact on the ground and then from there do breadcrumb following. And for this one, I didn't have anyone on the ground. I didn't know anyone who was there. Um, it was just literally turn up and to see how to go and trying to get the accreditation because this war is very different to the war I filmed in Iraq, Syria and Ukraine is that this was conventional forces against conventional forces yeah. and rather than an actual a terrorist organization or separatist. So I had to go down the route of getting accreditation, which eventually I did in the end. Um, and that's how the journey started, really. Wow, that, that that's amazing. So the other question I would have is a follow up. You, you know, spending so much time in Iraq uh, and in Afghanistan and and seeing ISIS and Daesh, uh, you know, develop and, the, and and all the fights that, that were happening there. We've heard a lot of uh, stories about, you know, fighters being imported. Did you see any of that? Can you can you tell us anything about uh, the way that uh, shaped up and, and how, how that played a part in this? Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of evidence. Um, there's a lot of open source evidence, a lot of intelligence reports that Syrian mercenaries that were used in that were used in northern Syria and Idlib area were transported to Libya, and then from Libya they were moved across a lot of them into um, Azerbaijan by Turkey. Um, there's a lot of evidence to support this. Prisoners of war were caught by the Armenians that verify this. There's several reports of men that have returned to areas like Idlib that confirm this. Um, yeah, there was definitely a use. Every every soldier I met in a frontline area would always tell me about Arabs. They would go, Arabs, Arabs. And they always explain that they're not, they're not Azerbaijanis, they're not Turks. They were Arabs, as in the sense that Syrian mercenaries were used. So there's no doubt in my mind from the amount of evidence I've physically heard um, I haven't physically seen any, didn't see any bodies, I confirm that, but from everyone I spoke to, it was it was too consistent to be a lie that right. everyone was talking about it. Um, and knowing that, like I was saying, there's so much open source information out there that it, for Azerbaijan and Turkey to deny it, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. There were reports yeah. that Turkey was flying Syrian mercenaries on Turkish airlines, commercial flights. Mm. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, Emil, you mentioned BBC a moment ago. I'm going to throw this, you know, we didn't necessarily script this question, but I'm going to throw it out there. What were your thoughts of BBC's coverage of the war and what was happening, especially knowing what you know now? Uh, I'm not sure how it relates to what you knew back then, but from us here, it was it's just completely it's completely biased what were your thoughts on on their coverage the way you've got to look at media companies is every media company is a business they all run off advertisement and everything else bbc works very differently in the sense that we all have to pay a license in the uk of of around about 200 dollars a year for the bbc so we all self-funded by the people of the united kingdom and also licensing that they sell films and stuff when it came to reporting BBC, as a big organisation that it is, had a team in um, in Armenia as well as a team in Azerbaijan. However, they, their reports were very much more leaning towards Azerbaijan rather than actually Armenia. This, I think this is two things. I think definitely because there's certain lobby groups that probably pressuring, pressuring them. However, the BBC generally, as news outlet goes, is generally quite impartial. It's probably one of the better ones out there. Um, but what I would also say, the second reason is probably, I think, is because the BBC were given access in Azerbaijan, therefore they restricted access in Armenia. And Armenia were very much restricting um, news outlets in. I, I felt the same. They wouldn't let us get to the front line as easy as we wanted. They didn't let us um, 
get the footage we want. They just wanted to show us like bomb buildings and civilians crying. That was really much, very much during the war. Of course, I'm not saying Azerbaijan is a, it's a country that champions freedom of speech. However, what they did is they were organizing media tours for company, big mainstream companies to control the narrative. And when you think about it as a news company and you've got two sides that, okay, I, I don't support either side, but one side I'm going to have to go find the breadcrumbs and find my own work and find the stories, or we can go to the other side, we're going to put us on a bus, they're going to take us to where we want and they're going to give us a story because we want the content. So very much there's two reasons there, I think, with the BBC mm -hmm. that their coverage was so much Azerbaijan, because Armenia's biggest enemy for control of the media was the Armenian government and press office. They failed massively. And oh. I spoke to several people since the war who realised, they put their hands up and go, restricting journalists, people like you, is, was one of our biggest failures because we didn't control the narrative. Well, I find that interesting uh, because it confirms a lot of what many of us have been thinking. Uh, and, you know, you are not an Armenian, so you don't have the same kind of bias that maybe the rest of us could be accused of. So I, mm -hmm. I just, I find that, uh, you know, I... I find that uh, I, you know, I don't even know how to process that, but that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. So what uh, what, what what Rich is trying to say is that we <clears throat> we are gathering intel as well, right? We in the diaspora have a have a filter. We're we're removed from a lot of things, right? There's a lot of things that you definitely understand and seen that we are only trying to kind of uh, deductively uh, understand. And for us, it's uh, a lot of things are just not adding up. Is that's that's kind of partially what Richard is, is yeah. for sure is, is, for is sure. mentioning. And um, sure. I guess what I wanted to say, so finally you are g granted access because the first time I saw you was through somebody sharing you on, on, on Instagram because we're here in the diaspora doing all we mm. can, uh, you know, uh, rallying, uh, uh, you know, so hosting a bunch of uh, rallies, talking to news media outlets, being blocked by a lot of them, by the way, here locally mm -hmm. as well, so, you know, CNN and whatever happened with them. Um, so we saw that, we saw the kind of the, the onslaught of the media uh, uh, PR arm of the Turkish uh, uh, lobby groups here. But you finally got access and I started seeing you, the, I believe the first time I saw you, you were, um, this is kind of sad. There was a there was, there was an el elder gentleman, which I think afterwards was confirmed he was killed. And, and oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, he was in, with you in a car. He stopped by, yeah, yeah. you exchanged some drinks or something. Um, that was the first time I saw you. So finally you, you got access, right? And you were able to make your way around. Yeah, that's quite late on actually, yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, yeah, so I finally got access in the end, and uh, it, it was an uphill struggle battling with the Armenians is because very much I felt drew throughout the whole war, all they were interested in was Russian media outlets. Mm -hmm. They were just, they were thinking the Russians are our potential saviors here. Let's get Russian journalists to the front lines. Let's get the Russian journalists have the access. And then what we could do is we can get potentially Putin and other people in Russia to get eyes on to see what's going on here. They weren't interested in Brits, Americans or anyone else. It was very much restricted and that. But yeah, but in the end, it got to the stage where I was just hanging around in Stepanica, the bombs were dropping and I was like, yeah, is it all good and well going around and seeing people's houses destroyed, but I need to get to the front line. That's what I do. I'm a former commando. Um, and then one, another journalist, a British guy who a photographer was like, I've, you might be able to get to the front line if you speak to such and such. So I was like, I went in there and spoke to him. And I just, I just without being arrogant, I just sat him down. And I said, I don't know if you know my background, but my background is I'm an ex-form of army commander. I go to water zones. Well, they kept on saying, oh, it's dangerous, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I had to say to him, I'm probably m the most experienced guy you've got here. And I go, I said, probably see more action than 99% of your soldiers on the front line currently. Right. I go, I didn't call, let me decide if it's dangerous or not. And in the end, they were like, right, okay. But there's still that very much that that fear of you've got to be a spy. Why else would you be here? It's that Armenian mentality that's very Soviet still into this day that you're a foreigner. You don't have, there's no reason for you to be here. Why do you want to tell our story? You've got to be working for a government. Um, so it was very much, it was, it was banging my head against the wall continuously. But then once I got the access, it, then it, it was a lot easier. We were hearing almost conflicting that that his areas were blocking access to journalists so this is a little bit surprising to me rich craig may forgive me if, if it was not to you a little it, bit, it, you know, no, it, it yeah. makes sense it makes sense as i'm hearing it but it, again i i'd rather you know i would definitely uh, uh listen to the eyewitness of first sure, of course yeah of course well, what i'll say then is they, they, yeah. they weren't restricting as such like the areas what people neglect in in war and conflict in in this day and age the majority of people that go to war zones to report are freelancers 
mm-hmm. is because mainstream media and big teams cost lots of money. So freelancers like myself who pay out their own pocket generally turn up um, independent people in these war zones. The Armenians didn't really understand that. They yeah. didn't understand that the how media works, that they buy foot mainstream buys footage of people that are independent this day and age. Not all the time. They will send teams, of course, but not as um, as long as as they, they'd want. So when you have loads of independents that are turning up, the um, Armenians are like, what's going on here? Who are you? And then slowly they're working it. But they, they were giving access to people. Like they to begin with, they gave me access to uh Nagel Kabak for I think 14 days. That's all they'll give me a, the the visa for the stamp um so they were allowing them there but they weren't giving them the access they wanted as such the zeris on the other side weren't really allowing independence in they were only taking mainstream media and they were doing press tours very controlled press tours so that's the difference that was going on people in azerbaijan didn't get the freedom like i did i could in, in theory once i crossed the border into Kabak, i could have gone anywhere i wanted they weren't like holding my hand as such. I could have gone anywhere, taken the danger, taken the risk as such. Um, but in Azerbaijan, it was very much, you're on this bus at eight o'clock in the morning. We're going to this location. Um, we will be there. We'll have our soldiers with you. We'll look after you as such. It was very different the way they control the media. Yeah. So uh, so now you're in, right? You you got the access. Which areas was was were your concentration? And you, you're speaking to people that know the maps, understand the topography very well. What's what? Where were you? What what was your? Yeah, so I was based out of the Padakets because that's where everyone was. That was the only place that really had food. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a bit. It was under siege. And then from there we went to Agdam, went into um, towards Martuni, uh, went down towards Hadrut. But Hadrut was very very dangerous in the sense that the Armenians were getting pushed back um, daily. Uh, so just moving around all the different areas, trying to get as close as I can to, to meet soldiers and find out what the story that was going on. Um, and the problem you've got is, is trying to be in the right place at the right time to get the good footage. It's, it's tough unless you're embedded from day one. It, it was tough. So it was a constant battle for me. It's like, right, I need to get some combat footage. Where where can I go to get this footage? Um, so it was a constant issue trying to find footage, um, especially when you're being restricted by people telling you don't film that truck don't film that soldier don't film this and it's like why can't i film this this truck's on google is it is it just a green army truck um so yeah it, it was a bit of a pain but in the end we've got some good footage we've got some brilliant stuff um but the documentary is about humans it's about people it's not about the guns firing it's not about the bombs dropping it's about the people and that's what we were focusing or that's what i was focusing on the film um and yeah just watching it back now so we're still we're only 80 percent of the rough cut done because issues of covid is slowing us down because the editors in america the producers in the states i'm now back in the uk we all came together in armenia a few weeks back to start editing um and so yeah we're we're getting there we're hoping for a late summer release i don't want to leave it Mm -hmm. too late because then people will be like oh it's it's been done now it's over a year ago um so we want to we want to get it less than a year before september but we need to get it right the documentary needs to be right and it needs to tell that story that so many people are expecting it to tell in this we're not expecting but the way that people can get some form of closure and the armenians that have actually seen it or the diasporans that have seen it have been part of the project have actually said by watching it they feel like they've got a little bit of closure which mm. to me is like wow um not because it's the, the story that they wanted they just see, they've seen behind the scenes really they've seen people that have been there on the ground and how they feel that they realize that their life in LA or San Francisco um, hasn't been impacted as much as that person there who's burning their home down. That's right. That's right. Well, I think I think you know I can't speak for the for, for the other guys, nor can I speak for the rest of the diaspora. But I I know for me, and I imagine for many of the rest of us, there's just such a with even with so much information kind of coming out, there's such a lack of understanding. Uh, mm-hmm. There are so many questions that we have when we were when we when it looked like we were you know holding Shushi instantly it was gone uh and and all these things began ha- happening in a very peculiar and suspect way and so many of us have got a lot of questions that continually remain unanswered so that said i just would i would i would offer up i can only imagine how difficult it must have been to find stories to tell let alone uh you know write one uh, or, or distill it all down to create the kind of work that, that you're putting together uh, based on some of what I'm hearing uh, were the conditions on the ground. 
Yeah, and the difference between the work I do, like I keep using the term breadcrumb um, mm -hmm. filming and journalism, is a lot of, if you're making a documentary, people, they know about the story, they know what they want to get, they want to achieve before they go out, they know the narrative as such. The way I do my documentaries is I just turn up, it's investigative, just turn up and just follow the breadcrumbs to see where it takes me, see who I meet. The best place mm -hmm. to meet people is generally in restaurants and bars because they go, I know a friend that can help you to get to the here. Well, I know a yeah. friend that's got this story. Um, so it's just connecting with people. And so really throughout the whole way of the journey, I didn't really have a story in my mind on how I'm going to tell it. Um, it was only once we got into the post-production phase that I, I had to sit down, lie on my bed in a dark room and think, how am I going to tell this story? What story arc are we going to tell here right. to get yeah. the story? And even now in the edit, I'm still revisiting it thinking that story arc doesn't work in that place. How do we connect? How do we segue from the story of the diaspora to the genocide? And how do we do, how do we segue from that to that character that's going out to see this family that just lost their son? Um, so it's yeah. still a, a constant um, battle to get it right. And we'll, we'll get it right eventually. Um, right. It just takes time. No, yeah. I believe it. And you know, one, one other thing I would say is um, while I think many Armenians have some justifiable historical reasons for a little, being a little bit like standoffish at first. I think once you get us to open up our mouths, it's hard to get us to shut up. Oh yeah. yeah. During, <laughs> during I've got a, a deep love for Armenians, but I've also got a deep, deep hate for you. Um, at the same time, I'll be honest with you, it's because you are an annoying race of people. You mean well and everything else, but you don't know when to shut up. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah, Emil, how did you go about, finding or selecting the people to interview or to cover or to, to tell these human stories um, yeah that's a good question we, we we filmed so many people we've got so many interviews um and we're, we're only going to use a percentage of them is it, and that's the thing that's the problem with filming is if you if i go to you david let's let's do an interview for the documentary and then you're like you're really excited you think i'm going to be in this documentary and then when it comes to the edit the cut you don't make the cut Right. And people are like, oh, I'm not going to be in a documentary. I'm like, I'm really sorry. It's like, well, I gave you, and it's like, you just have, sometimes you need to film so many people to get the people that you think that will fit for the story. Because I filmed so many people that I thought this will be brilliant. It's a brilliant interview. And then when it comes to the edit, it's like, doesn't work. Doesn't yeah. work with what we want here. If it was a standalone or something different, yeah, it would work, but it doesn't work here. So really, a lot of the soldiers I met that I filmed, they just worked perfectly. Like we've got the footage of me in Sushi, just on the outskirts of Sushi, the day after the, the war ended. And I've got all the soldiers just stood there on the side of the road smoking, waiting for the Russian peacekeepers to come. Um, and it's all misty, it's foggy. And they just like opened up to me. And, and the two main guys I spoke to both talk perfect English. And um, they're just on camera and you can see the the anger and the sadness in everyone's faces. And it was just like, it's perfect. I was just in the right place at the right time. Um, so yeah, I don't really have like a formula on how, who best to film. It's just content. Just keep filming, keep that camera rolling right. and then work out at the end what you're going to use. That's right. Yeah, we're grateful yeah. For, for your work, Emil, and telling our story. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep repeating that uh, because our story, our history is not told enough and it's not known enough. Um, and actually, this is a really great segue that you brought this up because I have a question that's a follow up from the the uh, virtual event you did last week with the AIER uh, Bastiat mm -hmm. Society uh, virtual event. Because you mentioned something about the soldiers in Shushi uh, and how you remember seeing them visually confused and devastated by what happened in Shushi, right? How yeah. essentially how I remember you, you mentioned something like how they thought they were winning. We thought they were, they thought they were winning and all of a sudden they, it was called off and they were told uh, it was called off and they had to, to leave. Could you tell us more about what you saw there and some of the yeah. thoughts on, on why, why they were feeling that way? Uh, perhaps what, what could you share with us? Yeah. So I spoke to many soldiers that were involved in Shushi and um, all of them were all say, have all said to me that they weren't, they weren't losing that battle. They were winning the battle. They were telling me that on the ninth, many of them were told to withdraw from their positions because what they were going to do is they were going to call in smirch, grad artillery to hit the, uh, the Azeris very hard um, to push them back. That attack never came from the Armenians. So they left their positions and they were like, are we going back? Are we going to retake our positions? And then they just got told on the, on late on the, well, early on the 10th that, it's over. 
the war's over. No, like, what do you mean it's over? We're winning. We've just left our positions to do another assault before we assault. Why are we pulling back? And the commanders were like, this is the orders. Put your weapons down and just go go to this point and meet. That's where we all meet and to go home. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of frustration. So when I met the guys, they were confused. They were angry. They were upset. There was so much, like, emotion in one place. And I was just like, wow. Um and one thing that does, I've said it in a few interviews, which sticks with me, is one guy, he was really upset. Um, we weren't filming at the time. I wish we had been filming this because it was, it was brilliant when he said it. He, he said, I'm, I'm sad that the war's over. He goes, but the only good thing off this, I know my mum can sleep tonight knowing I'm not going to be killed. Um, it was like, wow. Um, that's the reality of it. It's like, yeah, the guys, they wanted to keep this territory. Uh, but the reality is no one really wants to die. Um, and no, no, I think survivor guilt for a lot of these soldiers is because they've heard the stories of their fathers and their grandfathers in the 90s war they heard about the battles for shushi and how uh momentous momentous they were and in their eyes that they failed their nation by losing it and they felt frustrated that they didn't lose it because they stood and fought and died there they were they were it was given away it was given away so that's why they felt so frustrated that a lot of them felt like cowards one guy was telling me he's ashamed to go home and of course, the emotions are very raw because the war has just ended. But when you've got young men who are saying they're ashamed to go see their family because his father fought in the 90s, um, it's like, wow, it's, there's going to be a massive debt. Um, a, a, people go on about, we've lost a generation of men. Is that Armenia hasn't lost a generation of men at all. It's soon to lose a generation of men because a lot of men are going to be suffering from post -may -am post um, traumatic stress um it's going to be a massive increase in survivor guilt suicides if if men aren't treated so i think mental health is a massive issue here because so many soldiers are suffering from what they've seen in the war well if there's one thing i know about uh the way armenian men treat themselves and treat each other is that they don't talk about this stuff mm. so they're going to bury it i mean i would bet money on it i mean i don't think i don't think enough is said about Armenian women and um, about Armenian mothers specifically about how stoic and how like you know emotional they are they they can be for for good reason. But uh, Armenian men typically don't. Yeah, they just I I don't think it's part of what it, it, at least it's, at least there I don't think it's part of the culture to talk. Oh, about. Yeah. That's a societal norm. I, it, I I would like to say that, or like to think that it is changing slowly. There is much more uh, emphasis on mental health in the country and in Artsakh but as you said it, it's a very it's an immense problem it's a huge problem right now uh, mm. that needs yeah, to totally yeah. I, I actually I agree I think it's a it's, it's a great it's a great uh, uh theme to stay on and we'll address it more and more as the time progresses but I just kind of wanted to rewind back and back, uh, kind of stay focused a little bit on the Shushi and the ending of the conflict there are certain uh uh not evidences but like uh uh hints upon some uh traitorous uh moments in the war did the ending seem a little bit off to you as somebody that's seen wars and how they end did you feel that it was kind of cut abruptly um and did you feel that kind of uh you know something's off here at any point in in in, in your journey towards the end well, i i i can see very much the difference between the zeris and the armenians in the sense that it's david and goliath um seeing young men using AKs that are as old as their grandfathers. And it's like, realistically, as a landlocked country that's got no support from anyone else in the world, how long could Armenia actually physically hold out in this war? And to be honest with you, I don't think the Turks and the Zeris realised um, that the war would have gone on so long. Yeah. So they were quite shocked that the Armenians held out for 44 days of actual fighting, um, which I think they they probably thought it would be over in a week. So fair play to the Armenian soldiers um, for that. But the way it was coming towards the end, the social media started getting very busy and very heavy with the Zeris talking about Shushi, with loads of images of soldiers run with flags here, there and everywhere saying it's taken. I could see that that was a lot of propaganda to begin with that. I can imagine they gave loads of soldiers flags, told them run out there, get pictures quickly so we can upload it. Um, but it was very cru I knew it was crucial because I knew uh, strategically as a tactician of knowing how to fight wars is that if Shushi goes, Stepanaka goes. It's very simple. If you control part of the Latchin Corridor, the route in and out, you control the high ground, is the main city's then gone. So I knew it was crucial. So when it came to the ninth, I was like, 
this is actually, I actually said to myself, I go, tonight is a crucial night. And then at three o'clock in the morning, um, I got a phone call from Aras, who you talked about a minute ago, saying to me, the war's over, everyone's in Republic Square. So I, I rushed down there um, and there was massive confusions there. Everyone was like, what is going on? We've been told we're winning the war. Now we've told we lost the war. We've signed this over. Um, people didn't really know what was going on. So it was a very emotional times. But then what people don't realise is the government, in all wars, governments feed disinformation. There's two reasons they feel feed disinformation. Is one is to keep the war effort going, to keep the people supporting the war effort, keep the soldiers' morale up, and two is deception of the enemy. Um, so when you're getting told that you're winning a war and then all of a sudden you lose the war, is and people go, we were lied to. It's like, well, that's war. The war is full of disinformation. War is not just fought on the battlefield, it's fought in the information space. And if you go through history, look at, oh, in fact, I want to write a book on disinformation and propaganda. So I think it'd be people to see different conflicts and different wars and how it's used effectively or diseffectively and how it was um, failed is very much the information war is a very important battle to be fighting as well. Um, so I see why people are very upset that they were told they're winning then for them to lose. But really, Armenia was never going to win. They could never win that war. It's against the drones. Drones in this war, low scale, cheap drones were what broke the Armenian back. And if it wasn't 100%, if it wasn't for the drones toe to toe, my money would have been on the Armenian soldiers. One, they knew the ground, and two, they had the heart to fight. Um, the Zeris didn't seem to have that. Okay. But what they did have was the technology. And then, and this is this is not so much a question, more like a comment. Again, obviously, you know, having having lots uh, lots of research of the previous war and how things went down. Um, the one difference that uh, we we can definitely, as an Armenian nation, understand the difference in this war is that this wasn't us fighting Azeris. It was us fighting Azeris, the Turkish supported uh, militants, and the entire air war. From what we understand, and from what we now know, and actually NATO is now corroborating it, uh, the entire air operation at some point towards the end was taken over by the Turkish uh, military command. So essentially that is, uh, it, you know, it's not a way to kind of a, a better sw pill to swallow, but it's more to understanding how the cards were stacked up against the Armenian uh, soldiers. Yeah, you know. hmm? that's a good point there. I've got one of the soldiers that's going to be in the documentary. He stood on the side of the road on Shushi, like I was saying at the end on the 10th, um, or sorry, the 11th, this is. And he even actually says, this isn't an Azerbaijan war. This is a Turkish war. Mm -hmm. And then the other, then two other soldiers start shouting, Erdogan is Erdogan. Um, yeah, hundred percent. And the fact is that Turkey is a very, it's a strong nation. It's the second biggest army in NATO. Um, is, that went on, on the 27th of September, this was no accident that this war happened at this time. Everyone knew the world was busy with Trump's election. Everyone was knew that the COVID pandemic was taking over in the media. This was planned. Um, it's very much coming towards the end of fighting season. That's why I thought, I think the Turks thought it'd be over very quickly, is because September to October is the end of fighting season, as any, any country doesn't want to get into a winter war. You want to end it because then you know your enemy hasn't got time to regroup for the winter. So it's very planned to the T. Not only that, is on the 27th of September, the war was probably over in the first four hours, in the fact that Turkey had been marking, and the Azerbaijan had been marking recording positions across Karabakh since day one. They knew exactly where the telephone masts were. They knew exactly where military headquarters were because the espionage system that they must have used of people that are gaining information, reporting back, would have been second to none. That as soon as the strikes happen, boom, 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 they targeted the areas that they needed to the target. And the anti-aircraft missile systems, bang, taken out. They knew exactly what they're doing because, like we're saying, we're not... We're not talking about a tin pot army. We're talking about Turkey and Azerbaijan who have been arming themselves for many years, waiting for this moment. And uh, and obviously, thank you. This this makes the absolutely completes a, a, a bigger picture. And I hope the audience that's watching us uh, uh, can understand what was what was at stake and how it was performed. And that it wasn't. Uh, I often take offense personally when they say, you know, the soldiers did not do well enough. So I actually appreciate what you said that the Armenian soldiers, uh, the forty-four days that we went on, they went on. We had none, nothing to do here. We're here in the Bay Area. Um, that they uh, were able to hold off was a big, big surprise to uh, the Turks and 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 the Azeris. Yeah, I, I, I done an interview and I got I got really annoyed actually with the interviewer when he asked me this. And I, don't don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm British. I don't have any. Um, I'm not Armenian. There's no reason for me to support the Armenians and that. But what I saw firsthand, and he said to me, um, 
he started talking about the soldiers deserting. He goes like, how shameful was it for the soldiers that you saw that deserted? And I was like, I'm a former soldier myself. And I go, the reason the majority of these men deserted and left their positions was they had no command and control. They had no leaders there to tell them what to do. And I said, as I'm, most of these men aren't professional soldiers, they're volunteers. And when they've got drones that are killing 30 men here, there and everywhere, and you've got no commander there to tell them, this is what's going on. This is why we're staying in this area. Of course, they're going to leave their positions. And he was trying to make out as though the soldiers were cowards. It's like, they weren't cowards. Every soldier I saw would happily fight to the death. That's why they were there. But the fact is, they're not going to stand in the place where they're going to get bombed and killed for no reason, especially if there's no leadership there. And I go, that was the failure of this war was leadership, poor leadership. Um, don't blame the, the soldier, the grunt on the ground who was there. He, they'd done their job. Um, it's the leaders in this war that should be held accountable, not the men. Um, mm -hmm. So anyone who tries to turn around and say, I mean, the soldiers are cowards and didn't fight, mm -hmm. I'll stand up and say, no, that's not the case at all. And it, it, thank you for saying that. And it's a, as a matter of fact, it's a just, you know, all we need to do is look at a generation prior of how we, I don't know if anyone probably in Armenia told you the first time of the taking of Shushi and what was, yeah. uh, what was undertaken. Um, you know, we, we know we're not a, you know, we're not a nation of uh, deserters um, and the leadership was actually uh, lacking because uh, my cousins were serving and they told me firsthand what, what mm. they experienced and they were stationed above in Hadrut. Um, uh, thank you for saying that. You answered actually my next question, which was, uh, you know, was this more like an uh, ill-prepared army or was this uh, had something to do with, you know, the, the, there was a, a pattern of the government reforming and reforming and reforming and firing an entire top brass throughout the two years uh, past the revolution. And seems to me the answer is clear. It, 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 that kind of paid uh, a gross dividends in terms of once the war started, there was no leadership, clearly. And no, and I think there's massive, the failures really of the Armenian military is one, there's no investment into the military. Um, two is they heavily relied on the volunteer fighters rather than actual professional soldiers. Um, three, I think the Armenian military is still very Soviet mentality that it hasn't moved into a NATO standing in the sense that they still think main battle tanks are the way to fight wars rather than actual through technology. You remember, like we we're saying about Turkey's, Turkey's a very advanced military and is like I was saying about the wars fought in information space as well as it is on the battlefield, that also comes to electronic warfare. That also comes into intercepting mobile phones and stuff like this, cell mm. phones. Um, when you've got Armenian soldiers that are using walkie-talkies that are being intercepted about their communications or using their cell phone to speak to their commander, all that information is getting intercepted by the Turks and their Zeris. So very much electronic warfare here failed them as well because they don't have any secure communications which is a massive failure um so really yeah there's, there's so many different reasons but like i was saying is the armenian government has not invested in its military for years and also you've got pashian who's talking about well he only came to power not that long ago i haven't had time to implement it and stuff like that but yeah i totally understand it takes time but they, again they're still behind on their training on how to train up to a NATO standard rather than actually thinking a very Soviet era still. Um, and that was a massive failure there. Yeah, and uh, just, just, just a quick follow-up, David. I know I... Um, uh, go for it, man. No, uh, go for it. Go for one, it. one question. Uh, I, and it was also from a, from a talk you did on Instagram. Someone asked, and I want to double up and ask as well, um, you... Um, You've, there's a lot of people that you've interviewed. Were you ever trying to interview the 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 the, the, the prime minister? Did you ever reach out to them or any like member of the government? Um, or how how open were they to such a sit down? Yeah, so the prime minister, we've tried several times to get in touch with him um, for doing an interview, and I thought, being a former journalist himself, they'd be quite open. But then I just thought, really, what's happened with the war is that it's gone into damage control. He's batting down the hatches. Why? Why give any interviews out? It's, so apparently he's seen the trailer. Um, I was told that he's seen the trailer for the, the documentary. So I was like, that was a bit of like a, a moment. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he it was all it was constantly um, we're still evaluating it. He's not giving interviews at the moment. We'll we'll get back to you kind of thing. Um, the president, I went to the palace, I met the president's assistants, and they were talking about potential interview. And then in the end, we thought we decided that having anyone of a position I might become too political. Perfect. So the fact is the documentary is about humans, about the people. I didn't decided, well, I'm not going to get anyone involved. Um, they, were, they, were, they were offering me generals and people to speak to in government and stuff. And I was like, mm. I thought, I don't want anyone to have a political agenda in this documentary. So I just totally wrote the idea off and I thought, 
not interested anymore. It's not required. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're not going to include anyone now. But, yeah, we were chasing the Prime Minister for a very long time. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, Russia's presence there now. I mean, now that now that the war is over, now that there's a complete shift in, uh, you know, the events on the ground, uh, can you tell us about what what you saw, if anything, uh, about Russia's involvement? Um, what do you see as their position? Uh, you know, and tell, give us a pulse check on on Russia's, you know, connection with with Armenia and how they're going to mediate whatever's going on. Yeah. So Russia, as we know, is a superpower and they regional influence in that area. They they from post Soviet days, Russia is the biggest player in that area. They also had the military base in Gumri, where the Russians have been based. So very much throughout the whole war is a lot of Armenians were expecting the Russians to come to the assistance of Armenia. That's problematic for many reasons because geopolitically, you also got Turkey that signed allegiance to Azerbaijan very early, were very active in the war. So any involvement from Russia could then lead to direct conflict between Turkey and Russia. And on the international stage of geopolitics, Russia can't be involved in that. There's several reports, lots of reports, first-hand accounts, that Russian Spetsnaz soldiers were fighting alongside the Armenians. I've heard that from so many reliable sources. So I do know that they were potentially Russian military advisors helping the Armenians in places. But overtly, the Russians couldn't have been seen to help. They were helping towards the end with the anti-aircraft to shoot down drones, but they weren't overtly supporting the Armenians. When the deal was signed, the Russians moved from Gumri very quickly. So they knew full well that something, you don't move armor across the country that quick without knowing that it's coming. So the deal would have been in place, the talks of the deal would have been in place since I would say the beginning of November time. I then left, I was at Republic Square when it was all kicking off. People didn't know what was going on. It was chaos. I then went back to our hotel, me and the cameraman, we slept for a couple of hours and then we thought, fuck it, let's drive the Goomery. Let's get the Goomery, let's see what's going on. Okay. And we drove down there and we've got the footage of the tanks lined out on the road and them turning on the engine, the smoke coming up. And we're like, are these the first Russians about to move in? So we followed them in in our, in our white hire car. There's just my car in and out of all these Russian tanks, over 200 of them. Um, and we followed them all the way in across the border. So we've got some brilliant footage of the Russians moving in. Um, they stopped the night before because they didn't know where the Zeris were. So then we we then left them, drove back to Goris, drove round towards um, Daddy Van, come in from the north and then came to Spanakert from the other way. And then we went up to Shushi where we met the soldiers coming out and then met the Russians coming in from the other way. So we got all this footage. Um, we're just lucky to be in the right place at the right time, just um, taking our chances. So the Russians, when they moved in, they didn't really know what was going on as the soldiers. They were just like, we're, we're the peacekeepers, we're moving in. Um, were taken over. Very quickly, they then established bases along the Lachan Corridor. They then moved down to places like Martuni, Stepanica. Um, and no, no, the people from Kabak were welcoming of the Rus Russians, very welcoming. The Armenian soldiers were very welcoming when they saw the Russians of a superior force moving in because they knew it would stop the fighting. What I would say is that the Russians that I experienced were very nice. They were very like helpful to the Armenian people. They respected the Armenian people. Um, is that there was no negative from the Russians, that their stance is very much, we are the peacekeepers. We are here to stop the fighting. Um, we're not here to try to take over as such. However, what I did see was very much on all the roads, you'll see the Artsakh flag and then the Armenian flag, the other side, very quickly had changed the Artsakh and the Russian flag, that the Russians were implementing their their visual presence everywhere. Um, even on the border crossing point is now coloured Russians. The Russian flag is everywhere. So it's very much that if you didn't know and you had arrived there, it looked like Russia controls the area. But I think that's a double-edged weapon. One, in the sense that, yeah, they are controlling the area with influence. But secondly, it's a deterrent to those areas. That's right. So if they were to attack and it's like that's a Russian right. flag somewhere, it's like, you've now attacked us. You haven't attacked Armenia because the Armenian flag's not there. It's the Russian flag. Right. So way, it's a bit of reassurance for the people to say, we're here and we're, we're here to protect you. So I think it's good So that's in that sense. But again, a lot of people I mean, in the Karabakh region is they've got more of a loyalty to Russia than they have to Armenia from what I saw firsthand on the ground. Interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and then there is, there is a little bit of that duality there because uh, there's a kind of a, 
I mean, we don't need to get into it, but it's more like an in, in, in like it's kind of like an issue within the household, right? Mm. Um, uh, uh, Yerevan and Stepanakir do have a little bit of a kind yeah. of like, 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 like even, even as a foreigner, you kind of felt that, you know what I mean? Like, hold on one second, I'll do about that. Hold on. Uh, no problem. Uh, it's uh, morning for Emil uh, getting his day started. Uh, we're grateful. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate him being yeah. so so candid and uh, answering yes. questions so uh, so honestly. I think it's uh, sure. uh, we should probably you know it's the kind of coming up on the on the hour mark here. Yeah, yeah, um, I think definitely. Uh, yeah, sorry. Here. No, That's it's okay, Emil. Um, Emil, we're so grateful for for your time and uh, for joining us uh, this morning. Your time and and just being so gracious. Uh, with answering these questions, and you've shared so much information from your experience. Uh, you touched on something about the Russian peacekeepers. You know, as as we start to 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 wrap up the interview, uh, maybe just a couple more questions, um, and and we want to give you an opportunity to to share some final thoughts on the film um, as well. But the threat to Armenia's unique province right now. Uh, yes, the peacekeepers are there. We've heard there could be as many as ten thousand peacekeepers i'm not sure if that sounds like it's possible based on what you saw uh mm -hmm. but we're hearing that they need to expand their presence in the south and sunik because turkey and azerbaijan under the guise of exercises have moved artillery and military to the border this the southern sunik border yeah this is the type of thing that happened right before the artsakh war as well what are your thoughts from your experience and what you happen to see on what's happening with that and the actual threat that currently exists for armenia proper now um as Armen as turkey and azerbaijan have threatened to take this unique province by force now yeah the, the issue you've got is nagro karabakh region is a disputed region that is that's always well it's not always but is azerbaijani territory legally on paperwork doesn't matter if you agree with that or not um on paper is recognized as azerbaijan so when they go to war there they were then fighting for their own territory as such so when the international community didn't come to help armenia goes but well, we can't help you because you're really illegally occupying that land on paper we might support you but illegally you are the bad guys here to a certain degree so i totally get that <clears throat> when it comes to sunik that is actual armenia that's sovereignty territory of Armenia. And if you drive the road from Goris down to Kapan, is the road goes in and out of um, the new border as such. So you're in and out of Azerbaijan, back into Armenia, <clears throat> and you've got big signs saying, welcome to Azerbaijan. And then two miles down the road, you're back in Armenia. And then you've got another sign, welcome to Azerbaijan, back in Armenia. It's, it's, it's a really ridiculous border that the Russians, as part of their peace deal, should have dealt with that to say, to stop future problems we need to secure that this road needs to remain part of armenia you've also got the azeris that are talking about obviously they need that road to link up to the other part of their territory and if they don't have it they're going to take it by force or as such is i think very much if azerbaijan attack the sunik region that's a sovereignty part of armenia that's when the international community can stand by and go well no you've attacked armenia now you haven't fought for territory that's on paper yours you now attack the sovereign state and that's not on um the russians originally put 2,000 troops in on the 10th of november on monday i know for a fact is that the roads were closed because the russians were reinforcing on monday so they shut all the roads down they stopped people crossing the border uh, as they moved in more heavy equipment so the russians have been moving more into the sunik region as a precaution but the way i see it is russia is the biggest player and biggest kid in the playground in that area yeah you've now got azerbaijan that are still controlled by russia very much they've still got an influence there is that if the russians can't keep the peace in this small part of the world how can they keep the peace or have a geopolitical issues elsewhere in the world right. so it's in the interest of putin to keep the peace here because if he doesn't he loses credibility when when the world goes well why are you getting involved in this country putin and he goes oh well you couldn't deal with what was going on in armenia and azerbaijan how can we trust you to implement peace in this region here so i think very much is the russians will be with an iron fist saying to them you're not going to get, get away with doing that. Yeah. Um, I think very much the Zeris is playing hardball by pushing up their artillery and moving up their equipment very close. They're trying to scare um, Armenia. But also, you, 
you got to bear in mind that everyone knows that there's an election coming up in June in Armenia. Right. It's exactly. turbulent times. Politically, it's, it's unstable. So really, if they were going to do something, probably now's the time. That's the thing. Iran has their elections June 18 as well. And Iran has said, apparently, that their red line was that southern border. And if that southern mm. border is going to go, they might get involved. So, like, it, the risks are there. Greg Rich, if you have anything to add to this, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. we're, we're it, covering it. We're making sure we're constantly talking about Tunic on Arach Media. We feel like not enough people are talking about it. Um, yeah. yeah, I would just say from from an from an overview. First of all, uh, I appreciate you breaking all that that down. While I wouldn't push back or argue your point about uh, Artsakh being Azeri territory on paper, I will. I I, I just want to bring up that there's a particular irony in the fact that the Russians who are there keeping the peace now and who are our primary protectorates are effectively the same people that caused the problem in the first mm, place exactly. by making it a disputed territory. Yeah. Thank you, Stalin. Um, yeah. Thank you, Stalin. Mm. No, I think it's, 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 you know, because Armenians have been there for thousands of years. This is, it's only been Azerbaijan on paper because of it. Right, right. Coca-Cola. I mean, but you're Coca -Cola absolutely right, older. and I completely agree with you. Coca-Cola is older than Azerbaijan. So, Coca-Cola is older than Azerbaijan. <laughs> Greg, go ahead, man, go ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah, and obviously, as you see, as you see, you can, you yourself see this, uh, this, uh, insanity of a road right it was the reason why it's that way is because it was in soviet union and they thought well who cares it's it's all part of the right. same thing. yeah mother motherland and but you know the foresight wasn't there when when these countries split apart what kind of a nightmare is going to be so, no but what i'm saying is that in this in this peace agreement this trilateral peace agreement that should have been something that should have been yeah. stated because they knew this will be another problem with the Azeris who are very aggressive regional aggressors at the moment um, okay. And I think they're getting that sense because they've got the backing of Turkey. That's why they are constantly exactly. pushing at the moment. You think Erdogan's crazy enough to attack Sunni? I think Erdogan's crazy enough to do anything. He, he's a, he's yeah. a guy that is very much a dictator and he's only ever going to leave power in a box. Um, is because yeah. he's, he's always going to be the leader of Turkey until the day he dies, I very much believe. And I think very much, you remember the Turkish coup that happened? And how mm -hmm. fake that yeah. looked and seen, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, um, yeah. And then since then, he, he's he's grown in power in the sense that he's suppressed rights on academics, people at the opposition, journalists. So very much, yeah, I think he's possible for anything um, to do. But, but has he got forget. bigger things to worry about? Is yeah. the Karabakh region now under control of Azerbaijan? Is their main agenda? Has he got anything else? Yeah, they want to link Turkey to Azerbaijan. Right. They want Which, to have a physical road. Sadly, is part of that nine-step agreement that road mm -hmm. across Sunik to Nahichevan. But yeah, that, that, <laughs> Greg, you were going to say something, man. I, I, I don't I think that's through Georgia. No, no, it's it's yeah. it's 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 uh, yeah, it's a humiliating time for Armenia. Uh, back to the human human point uh, of the you know you 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 see a lot you you deal with people. What's the morale in Armenia like? You've been last what a few weeks ago. You were in Armenia, right? Um, uh, how how is how is the country in your opinion currently? What's what is it? Is it a state of chaos and confusion? Is it mourning? Is it or in your you actually foreshadowed it? You said mental health wise, the worst is yet to come. Unfortunately, and let's let's be candid about it. Yeah, I, I was I was in Armenia last week. I got back last week, and um, it's I have a I have constant battles on social media with people from the diaspora who really annoy the mm. shit out of me. I'll be honest with you, is that these people like why are these people out enjoying themselves? Why are you out having dinner and drinks and stuff? And it's like the country done their forty days mourning. They've moved on, and this resilience of people is that when you're in a war zone and um, where you've lived through a pandemic, you've lived through a, a recent war, people want to get on with their lives. They don't want to be sat there dressed in black mourning forever. And I know some people from the diaspora who are living in their, in their lovely houses in LA don't really understand that um, while they've got their swimming pool there and are worrying about what they're going to have for dinner. But what they don't realise is that the average Joe who's in Armenia needs to get on with their life. And that's what they're doing. They're going out, they're dancing, they're singing, which Armenians love to sing. Um, and they're just getting on with their life. And it's like, yeah, why not? Why? And the people are like, yeah, but we still got prisoners of war being held. They go, yeah, we understand that. Everyone knows that. But it doesn't mean that people got to live in like dark times. People got to move on. Um, so the morale, from what I'm seeing when I'm in Armenia, is great. Is things, of course, there's political instability. There's people that are going out in little protests. Um, there might be a big protest here and there, but they're generally not violent. 
Um, they just go out, do their little thing by the opera or down Republic Square, and then they move on. Is Overall, the city is in a really good place. And I've, I've seen it very much different from the, during the war, just after the war, post-war, and then now. And it's a totally different vibe, especially Eurovan. Um, totally different vibe now. And I recommend for anyone at the moment to go there. It's very safe. Um, one thing I will say about the Armenian police is, do you mean fair play to the Armenian police? They are like brilliant police force. And the way they, they do their business in, in the city is, like we're saying, there was a protest the other day where they were throwing eggs at cars. And it's like, imagine in any other country, they wouldn't be throwing eggs, they'd be throwing bricks, but I mean, they throw eggs and stuff like that. So he's like, yeah. yeah, I think the morale in the city is, is lifted from what it was. Of course, there's still issues. The biggest um, bone of contention for everyone is the prisons of war. Um, but it doesn't mean that people still can't go out and enjoy themselves. So I would say to anyone that's listening to this, that wants to condemn anyone in Armenia for going out and having dinner or having a drink, uh, think twice about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, you know, again, I think I think that a lot of us uh, felt, and I can't again, I, I can't speak for the for the entire diaspora, but I know that many of us have felt a rise of like, what can I do? How do I participate? Mm. And the and the distance that we are from the action and the the, the levels of a deterioration of of the information once it gets to us and the fog of our own war, um, mm. I think has created this, the, some of the situations that you're talking about. In other words, people are, are reacting to the, the space that they're living in, which is I'm attached, I'm connected, but I, I want to participate, but I don't know where you guys are at. And I don't understand yeah. in such a direct I, way what's going on. I call it um, diaspora guilt in the sense that they're right, so sure. far away from what's going on that they feel sure. guilty that they're not sure. doing enough. And I think diasporans, the way they see to help is by throwing money at something. Um, and we all know about an, a dad who doesn't really love his kids, but he just throws money at them. It's not that real love as such. So they get that guilt that's there. And I think everyone who I've met from the diaspora that's come over to Armenia since the end of the war is they all like in shock. They were like, wow, being here is so different now. I'm, I'm relaxed. I feel more grounded i can see what's going on and now i understand why people going on with their lives I understand why um people want to go back to work and people want to go out for dinner and stuff like that is because that you know it's like when you're so far away just say you you've got your girlfriend now and she's out or your wife's out and you don't know where she is and what she's up to you, you get that like panic like what's she up to but then if you go to the bar or to the restaurant and you're sitting there you go oh she just sat there with her friends it's chilled i think very much like the diaspora is that way yeah. is that when they go to armenia they can relax because they go it's not as bad as i thought it was because from thousands of miles away it looks terrible and i'm hearing these stories uh but being here i i can see it firsthand and i think very much so is, is so that the diaspora guilt is kicking in with people and knowing that as the diasporans you're sometimes your worst own enemies especially with the disinformation is the sharing of just bullshit on online the, yeah. the memes that everyone just shares and it just gets this everyone panicking everyone angry and it's yeah it, it can be a bit of an emotional like to watch that people just go around in circles and i think yeah a, a lot of a lot of social media activism yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um yeah. why don't Black you kind of uh uh, you know, kind of uh, segue and maybe even kind of wrap up with with the with with the documentary itself, right? The focal point of what we're trying to uh, talk about here, and also you know, uh, lean into us how we can promote it once it's out. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying that your deadline is probably looking at towards the end of the summer, right? Is that what you were? What your yeah. So um, the pla the issue I've got is because I go to war zones, my my flag my passport gets flagged, so I can't get the visa waiver to come to the United States. So I need to physically go to an embassy to get to say I'm a journalist. This is why my passport's been to Iraq, Syria. Mm -hmm. um, but no embassy is open to process an interview for me to do that. So I can't get to United States at the moment. So which is a real pain as, as well, especially when the embassy is open and there's going to be a massive backlog. So I think it's going to be very problematic for me to get to America for such something so simple. Um, so potentially we might have to return to Armenia at the end of May as a team to then complete the edit. Like I said, we're 80% off the rough edit, uh, maybe for two weeks, to then bring us into June to then hopefully send it to the post house in the States to start doing the sound mixing, composing, um, color grading, ready for best case scenario. By the end of June, we've got complete documentary. Then what we could do is start pushing out for distributors, distribution to say who's interested in trying to take this on. Um, and then ready, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, for 
the middle July to August to start doing screenings, start doing a premiere, get it screened. This is just a rough timeline. It could change um, is to get it out there because I don't want it to be going on over a year after September as such. So we want to get it out. Um, the issue you've got is obviously COVID is the massive restriction on everything we've got here now. Uh, but yeah, we're in a good position. And the documentary is looking great. But like I was saying, there's a lot of pressure on me to get this right because it this has been a GoFundMe um, project that people are like, well, what have I donated the money for? I don't really like what you've done there. I know you're not going to please everyone. I can't please everyone. Um, and it's, it's a 90-minute documentary. There's only so much I could tell in 90 minutes with such a complex story. Mm -hmm. So it's just picking the best bits and I think So we're not going to make everyone happy, but I think the majority of people will be very happy. And um it's an emotional watch at times. So, so the fight against the Islamic State, Europe's Forgotten War, and now 45 days. 45 days, uh, the fight for a nation. The reason why we the war was 44 days um, long, but the 45th day was the 10th of November when the peace agreement was signed. So really, the 45th day was the most crucial day in the turning point of Armenians' history. And that's why we went for 45 days. Yeah, thank you. That was actually a question I had. I'm going to thank you for answering that. And Emil... Thank you so much for for your time and for your generosity with us. Um, you are a friend of the show. You are an honorary Armenian. I'm going to say <laughs> that. Uh, I, I'm going to go and say that because uh, we are grateful for for you being a voice for our people and for what our our, our soldiers and our people have gone through in this war. Uh, it really was and is a fight for for our nation that uh, continues to this very day we are very we are so grateful and we hope to stay in touch with you um and right. and do more work with you uh, ongoing um how can people help uh contribute towards the film uh, how, how can we help share awareness in the film and any last word you'd like to share about the film before we sign off here tonight yeah no just everyone that's supported the project since day one um really much appreciate um we've got a gofundme account that's up on gofundme just 45 days uh, but main thing for people to support is just share, just share the work that we're, we're posting. And at the moment, content's going to be a bit dry because we're in the editing phase now. But once we start hitting the marketing, it's going to we're going to start ramping it up. So yeah, just share, just spread the word. And um, like this documentary, we don't. I don't want this documentary for Armenians. It's not a propaganda documentary for Armenian people. It's a it's a documentary that we were tailoring for the international audience. We want someone to sit down to put this on television, then 90 minutes later go, I actually know something I didn't know 90 minutes ago, and I see why right. that this war was so important to these people. Um, and that's what that's what we want, because our means are going to watch it anyway. You're a captured audience. Mm -hmm. So this is what we want to tailor it. We want to tailor it for the average Joe who doesn't know anything about this, and then actually a bit of an education for 90 minutes. So really, that's what we want. But yeah, I want to thank everyone that has supported so far. Um, and yeah, we'll keep in touch, definitely. Hey, fantastic. Thank well, you know, Armenian issues uh, aside, I just want to thank you for doing the work that uh, everyone needs done, and not everybody has the stones to do it. So <laughs> thanks. Very yeah. much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emil. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, good, yeah, good yeah. night, guys. Have a great day, Emil. And uh, Cheers, we'll see you guys next week. Okay. See you later. Good night. Well, all right. Wow. That was. Uh, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. I was uh, re-watching it and kind of reliving the conversation. Yeah, just I, as insightful the second I, time, right? Sorry, Greg. Yeah, go ahead. I would like to say that I appreciate the honesty. You know, yes. where wherever it suits us, wherever it doesn't, doesn't matter. Right. I really, really appreciate the honesty, and thank you for everyone that's kind of stuck around. I know it's a rather large interview. Um, you know, we're. We're, you know, we're happy that we can bring this to you. And obviously when Emil's uh, um, documentary will drop, uh, I believe it's slated for kind of before the anniversary of the war, uh, we will, you can definitely count on us to try to promote it and make sure that people know how to watch it. Um, you know, and if, you know, if there's a way to like pay to watch it, it's something that we should consider as well. You know, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. We need to support the people that are trying to support us. Um, yeah, and actually, Greg, that's a good point. The link to his GoFundMe is on the post. Uh, we can also put it in the thread, but it's on the post right there. It's also on our link tree already, as well as the link to the trailer, I believe, or, or to his website is on our link tree as well. So people can support. I just did. I brought him up to 8,700, uh, 87,000, excuse me. 
So yeah. I invite others to, to do that as well, because he is providing a voice for us that no one else really has. So and I'll let you know, like sometimes, you know, I, I kind of tell myself, do I want to get into this or not? I'll say some things that I kind of hear in the echo sphere out there. Right. Um, you know, there's like, oh, you know, we Armenians can tell our own narrative. We don't need the white savior complex. No, this person did not need to come there, you know. He could have just as easily come on the Azeri side. Well, he couldn't have actually. They would have booed him out. But, you know, he could have focused on any any other conflict. He could have gone to Yemen. So many things, right? But uh, sometimes I uh, we uh, there there was a uh, there was a Bulgarian journalist that came and did the same thing in the first war, okay? Uh, she did not have to come in, you know what I mean? But she did. Um, and we can kind of do a bit on that. We as Armenians need to kind of be happy that there are these kind of voices of, you know, other non-Armenian, uh, 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 what do you call it, entities coming in to kind of see a story, hear a story, and be interested enough to understand and tell not our truth, just the truth. And when we are on the right side of the truth, that is just enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, a simple way of putting it is is that you know we can't be a nation of people who are constantly asking for others' help and acknowledgement and then shut them out. That seems ridiculous. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it was disappointing to hear the restriction on journalists that he detailed. Uh, but you guys, hearing it again was just as insightful. And I really appreciate his knowledge of the situation, uh, his intelligence. You could tell he's an, just an intelligent guy. Um, and just his willingness to go there, like you pointed out, Greg. Um, and he's an honorary Armenian in, in my mind. So I'm uh, grateful well, for him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh obviously him having a, a lot of uh, wartime experience yes. definitely kind of plays into the account of him understanding Absolutely. what he talks about what he talks about it um you know regardless of what your stance on war and people in the military is um the right, other thing he is knows, like, he knew the situation he knew what was going on there right like his, well, at least yeah, he knows he understands, now. he understands yeah. battlegrounds he like look he understood what shushi is and it's juxtaposition in the entire area that bit of the interview might be very interesting for a lot of folks that are you know haven't heard it the right way or haven't heard it exactly. you know, or maybe are done hearing it from richard or david or myself and now right. can hear another person say right. you know especially the bit about the soldiers going like being asked to retreat yeah, uh, like tactically that. utilize weaponry and then that weaponry was not utilized let's also kind of circle back to what remember the supposed coup that happened over Pashinyan criticizing Russian uh, uh, missiles. What's the missiles that he was saying that essentially we never used, right? Um, this is all part and parcel of like a an unfortunate bigger plan that I feel we will all learn one day, okay? And right now we in Arash Media can only bring you pieces of information. Right, and what, um, what we know, yeah, or what's-, what's Yeah, been what we know so far. Um, Rich, uh, carry us through, man. Well, there's a lot to talk about, and we don't have a tremendous amount of time. I and mean, we, we, we have as much time as, as we decide, of course. Right. Uh, but in, in respect to everyone else's time and for right. the length of this, uh, you know, our topics tonight are obviously to talk about the POW situation, uh, the dismantling of our beloved cathedral, um, the destruction of sites in Hadrut, um, a huge stain on the Biden administration, Yes, um, especially on the heels of recognizing the genocide, which many of us have been working for for decades, um, you know, and then, of course, the the on the ground situation with Pashinyan. So um, perhaps the best place to start is the POWs. And I, you know, I will um, surrender my part of the discussion on this topic and simply act as the producer and toggle through um, a lot no of worries, these. Man. And I'll do no my worries. best to, to put them up, uh, put, put the links up in real time. So what yeah, I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to begin sharing this screen over here, and then you guys can. Um, sure. You know, uh, I want to yeah. thank everybody. We got 14, 15 people live watching us. Thank you so much, and you know, sticking with us. Let's power through it. Let's let's do it, guys. Let's let's bring the news. And Rich, thank you, man. Rich, thank you. Man. Uh, let's see. So starting off. So we got three POWs uh, who have returned home to Armenia. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, this happened recently, and uh, it also happened on the uh, kind of the cusp of uh, the uh, news of the 19 POWs that were um, um, essentially tortured and killed, right? And yes. 
um, although we can be very obviously, um, again, and this is this is crediting the OSC men's group, you know, coming in in the 20, whatever, fifth, or at this point, what should we call it, 27th hour, um, a little too late in my, uh, in my yeah, book. Where, where were they during the war, right? Before yeah, the war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, it is being credited to the international bodies. It's being credited to a lot. Uh, but when I saw this, I was like, oh, initially when I was like, uh, I didn't see the Osbares news feed. I saw uh, others. Armenian POWs returned. And then I see the plane. I was like, oh, good. They're going to return a lot of people. No, three. Uh, so they're going to keep on like, you know, peace, you know, feeding yeah. it in, 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 in small batches. And unfortunately, back to this conversation, um, as we remember, remember Maral, the uh, Lebanese Armenian woman that was stolen from uh, Artsakh in the, in the days ending after the, 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 the ceasefire, which was even a, a gross violation of its own. But there was another Ar Armenian man that was also uh, um, uh, a POW essentially. Um, and this time around, he is going to be standing trial because yeah. they're, uh, they are going to be uh, giving him the, what is it? They're accusing him of being a hired mercenary. Right. And I want everybody to understand Azerbaijan, when the war was happening, was playing the, the, the duality constantly. When we had a guy play a violin in the Ghazan Chetsot as a juxtaposition of the sadness of war and the beauty of music, they had a guy playing Kamancha on top of some rocket in a in a studio somewhere. And you know, like they're they're like constantly trolling us. It's going to happen over and over and over again. Right. Um, and again, you got three people that are being let go, 19 tortured. And then this- That, that this, we know this, of, right? This, They've identified yeah, those 19. Yeah. Tortured and killed. And then this one man is going to be standing trial for essentially they're, they're piggybacking off of the idea that, you know, we're accusing them rightfully of hiring mercenaries. And uh, they are actually uh, uh, trying to like push that back on us. Like right. he's not yeah. Armenian; he's just some guy that's from uh, Lebanon that was hired to come. You know, right? When we know before. they actually hired Syrian mercenaries, right? Uh, the names of the POWs uh, that were released are Robert Vardanyan, Samvel Shukyan, and Seiran Tamrazian. I hope that they are okay in decent health somehow, and that they're going to get the treatment they need. And that they've been able to be reunited with their families. Uh, and yep. the POWs, we know there's still more than 200 in captivity. It could be even more than that. They need to be returned home. Greg, you mentioned the release of the 19 POWs, names and details of their murder and torture and killing, right? So here is that word there. Um, yes. Yeah, um, so. Moving along, moving along, what uh, <clears throat> the we also have continuing, right? Uh, again, uh, the sorry, I get a little. Uh, it's, it's a little emotional because I, I know the places. Um, there's the, the continued destruction of all things Armenian. Uh, Richard, you mentioned the Razan Chetzos Church. Um, here is the footage of the POWs tortured and killed by uh, Azeris. But there's also that yeah. the, the, the this this week we saw a gross. Uh, uh, mistreatment or reappropriation of the Razan Chetzos Cathedral in Shushi by the removal of the dome. Um, again, this is something that some people that I, when I talk to them, they say we should, you know, not be surprised because this is exactly what they're gonna do. This is the, this is exactly what they're capable of, but nevertheless, this is a gross violation. And actually while we we're playing the video with Emil Giesen right now, I saw that the Human Rights Watch, I'm also a little bit critical of and uh, Rich, we don't have that link, don't worry, um, is saying that maybe that might be a, uh, a, a human rights violation. I don't know how that is and nothing else, but okay, I'll take what we can. Um, I, this is just something I just saw. Um, that was a clear, 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 uh, uh, you know, affront on our, on our culture and uh, definitely a reforming of what we know as Shushi. It's the second church in Shushi. We already saw Kanan Jam, the green church that was completely destroyed. Um, and now we have Razan Chetzos as being, um, you know, altered. Like they raised it all the way to the ground as though it was never there in the first place. 
the Kanan Jam, the second choice. Yeah. And we, okay. we covered that a few months ago. Right. Well, um, and also, so, we just covered how they have artillery or military equipment around that the other church. Um, and I, I apologize, I don't remember the name of it. Um, the, the church that was uh, 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 further out next to Arbaum, which is a right. further out east. Um, right. So what they've so, done, the Gazanchet Shots, they've removed the domes, which of course have the crosses on them. Who knows what else they're going to do? Of course, they're calling it renovations, right, Rich? That's what they're calling yeah, it. Yeah, I'm going to put it up uh, right now. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, and, uh, you know, we know that actually echoing back to Matthew Karanian's interview that we had, uh, um, renovations over time stands for appropriation and erasure. So, exactly. Um, Exactly. Um, we we know that that dome did not need any renovating. Look at that right now. There um, it is. Yeah. That dome needed no renovating. It was a, as a matter of fact, it was fully restored and replaced only nine years ago. Um, right. So exactly. that well, you know also, what I mean. Yeah. yeah. To be fair, it did have a big hole in it, but you, you know, know that's because that they, they put it there. That they caused you know. right a hole that they created yeah. a couple holes. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm just trying to be tongue in cheek. Otherwise, I'm going to be livid. I'm going to say a bunch of four letter yeah, words. No, no, I can't yeah, no, no, around. same, man, same. It gets worse as we go. I hate to say it, just to warn the our audience. Uh, the news gets doesn't get a whole lot better. Um, the right. yeah, I mean, you got the monuments in Hadrut now that are reported to be destructed. Uh, this Caucasus Heritage Watch on Twitter. Eight. They've been cut. They've been. Yeah, the, it's amazing. I've never heard of this organization before, and they have this satellite footage of monuments that are now all suddenly gone. Right? Not just monuments. Yes. Not just monuments. Yeah. This is a whole cemetery. A cemetery. Yeah. Um, and you can tell exactly how it's done. It's you know it's done. You can tell from the footage via satellite. It's not just a cemetery. It's the adjoining houses. It's the it's the it's the you know uh, uh, the greenery around it. This is a nasty, nasty nation. I'm this sorry is, anybody wants to want to criticize me for saying that. This is pure a hatred. hateful, hateful, hateful human beings and a dictatorship that will only end one way. And we will see that day, I promise you. Um, so well, I certainly hope so, because I'll tell you what, you know, like like you know, when when people talk about the bad juju that happens in America because of building on top of Native American lands and Native American uh, sites. You know, the, the same kind of bad juju is going to be surrounding the, yeah. these people. There's just no question about it. If yeah. there is a God, if there is some sort of, you know, balance in the universe, um, this has got to rank in there so somewhere. Yeah, it has to. yeah. absolutely, Rich. Well said, man. Anyway. They, there's a special place in hell for these people. Uh, we've been, I've been saying that since the war, and here we are. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, so Caucasus Heritage Watch, follow them on Twitter. They've been having this really, really just difficult news for us to, to witness. Um, yeah, I guess, shall we move to the Section 907? Or where are we at, guys? Yeah, David, I mean, you, yeah. Yeah, that's probably the best place. Yeah, you, 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 you kind of have the pulse on that. I, and we I, should probably spend a minute or two on this. Yeah, so. Yeah. So guys, uh, and, and Rich, you, you touched on it in the overview of the show. And thank you again for everybody that's sticking with us uh, late tonight and everybody watching us after the fact on Facebook or, or YouTube. Thank you uh, for watching. Please share, please like and share and comment um, all day, every day. Uh, we are growing our following and we appreciate everyone's support and interaction. You guys, April 24, Joe Biden, Joseph Biden, I don't know his middle name, anyone know his middle name, Joseph Biden becomes the first president to recognize the Armenian genocide as a sitting president, right? Not as a senator, not as a former president, right? Now, just days after his administration is going against what he campaigned on, not the genocide, not promising to recognize the genocide, but calling for the enforcement of section 907 of the Freedom and Support Act. We can share the link in the comments of what that is, but what that was was in the early 90s, it was banning military aid to Azerbaijan because they were attacking Armenia and Artsakh, right? Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. They were attacking in the early 90s, this section 907 was, was created. Since 2002, it has been waived every single year. Sure, 2001, 9-11, yes, that's the reason that's been given starting then 
But now Joe Biden campaigned on making sure to not waive it and to continue to enforce it because of Azerbaijan's bad actions, of course, with the help of Turkey. What are they doing? They go ahead and they are waiving Section 907. What, what does that mean? It means that it's going to allow for the administration to continue to send military aid, not just any aid, not humanitarian aid, military aid to Azerbaijan. So, so, this so in, let's, let's put that and in. This is the Hill reporting it. The Hill is reporting it. This is happening. We can try to prevent it. It is happening. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, because so so let's let's just put this in like layman's terms. On one hand, you recognize the genocide. On the other hand, he's allowing a financial uh, poss- the, 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 the probability that money that U.S. taxpayer dollars are going to fund the the continuation of the same uh, policies that are genocidal against us. So it, it's it's like a it's like a gut punch. I mean, on one hand, you know the, the the things that initially brought the three of us together and the things that we've been working for for decades has come to fruition. It's like a milestone, and within a week, within the six days, now all of a sudden he's saying, "Yeah, that's okay." Uh, keep going. You guys can do exactly what I just condemned. It's. It is. I, I don't have the words for it. I don't well, have the words. So for it. I'm, I'm so terribly disappointed. It, it's betrayal. It's betrayal, in my opinion. Go ahead, Greg. Sorry. Well, the, the if we're going to uh, uh, be very technical about it, the genocide had. Uh, you know, we know that Azerbaijan and Turkey are uh, one nation, two countries, as they call themselves. But for the all intents and purposes, there's 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 the Republic of Turkey, and then there's the uh, uh, what do you call it, the Nazi state of Azerbaijan. Sorry, um, and that the United States is essentially saying the genocide recognition is probably on the Turkish side. This is some beef that you're having with Azerbaijan. Um, you know, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little short-sighted. Um, yeah. What well, I, think, I also think that there's an element of of the, we're going to keep on giving you money because we want you to help contain Iran. All of that. Because that's all what. Of that can be. You know, that's, that's part of what they, they lobbied for in the f- first place. I mean, you know, in the last years of the of the Trump administration, we saw the numbers for, for uh, Azerbaijan go up to, what, $100, $110 million? When it was left at $10 million dollars for the Armenians. 100 million, like, zero to yeah. Armenia, zero to Armenia. 100 million to Azerbaijan, zero to Armenia. Under the, the guys. And then we wonder why our soldiers are fighting with decades old AKs. And we wonder exactly. why we don't have drones. And we wonder look, why we got our asses handed to it. Right. Because, like Elizabeth said, remember last week, our guest from ANCA, communications director Elizabeth Children, she said it. Yep. Whether they use that 100 million directly, to kill Armenians or not doesn't matter because that 100 million frees up another 100 million, right? So guys, real quick, Blinken certified that such assistance to Azerbaijan would not undermine or hamper ongoing efforts to negotiate a peaceful settlement between Armenia and Azerbaijan (coughs) or be used for offensive purposes against Armenia. A State Department spokesman, US security assistance programs in Armenia and Azerbaijan are designed to enhance regional stability and are carefully monitored to ensure that they do not hamper ongoing efforts to negotiate a peaceful settlement to the conflict. Blinken finally certified that providing U.S. assistance is necessary to support U.S. efforts to counter international terrorism or is necessary to support the operations readiness of the United States armed forces or coalition partners to counter international terrorism or is an important or, or is important to Azerbaijan's border security. Excuse me, who was attacking Artsakh and the Armenian people? It wasn't Artsakh. So what border security is he talking about? Is he talking about Iran? Is that what he's talking about, Rich? Greg? Is he talking about Russia to the north? Or where no, where's he talking about? Part of, he talking about? Part, of, part, of, part of the the um Part of the money that part of the discussion around giving them more money in the first place was that they were going to contain them in the in the sea there, right? They were going to contain them. They were going to, that Azerbaijan was going to project through Baku out into the water there and and help rein in uh, 
uh, Russia, Iran, but that's oh, Iran. but that's a joke. That's a joke. If that's there's yeah, yeah Greg, Greg, what I mean, border I don't are sit in the State about? Department meetings, of course, but I, I'll, but David, I'll be honest with you. Unfortunately, I'll give you the honest thing: the border that they're talking about probably is with Iran, but in reality, the border that they're talking about is with Armenia, and they're doing all they can to help them secure the border with Armenia, which is what happened by getting rid of Armenians. I'm telling you, this is what's happening. Yeah. So, yeah, and um, you know what? And it's not going to help our cause very, 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 very much. The the closer Armenians get to Russia, but who? But what else are we supposed to do? What else are they supposed to do? Anyways, we got to uh, get close yeah, to Russia. We're dependent on Russia. We're completely dependent on Russia. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, it's um, beyond disturbing it's, and betrayal to me. Uh, I'm very. Dis I'm beyond disappointed. Go go ahead, Greg. Perhaps. Well, I just, we, yeah, you know we've uh it, you know definitely we'll continue uh updating those folks that are interested and want to kind of be updated on these kind of nuances about what's happening geopolitically this is again a uh, miscalculation on the united states side um they could definitely play that game of you know we did something to reprimand turkey but when we also continue giving it's, cookie to uh, exactly. uh azerbaijan exactly. a totalitarian state and nothing to a country that quote unquote uh, lean towards a democracy, although I wish we never did. That's just me. Um, nevertheless, the United States being that country that See. kind of likes to talk a long game about uh, 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 democratic uh, being the right. leader of democratic world. Uh, right. Anyways, finally about the Democrat that came to our power, Mr. Mikol Pashinyan, um, the, uh, the journalist prime minister. Um, so, uh, Levon de Petrosian, the man that uh, is the first Armenian president, uh, he is also, in my opinion, the man that kind of oversaw the, the you know the beginning and the end of the first war. Um, he's also the man that's created the, the 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 systems of corruption and in Armenia. You know, there's a lot of things. He's also the man that started the political career of set yellow journalist journalist for hire, Mr. Nikol Pashinyan, um, has come out with a very, very pointed uh, statement saying that, you know, uh, voting, having Nikol present is worse than any threat that is we are be facing from Azerbaijan or Turkey. And I've had a couple of very choice conversations with a lot of people going, oh, that's a bunch of baloney, blah, 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 blah. Stop pointing fingers. Okay, I have no love for it. But for that man to come out and kind of like state yeah. that yet again, yet again, yeah. he's done it before, he's doing it again and much more pointedly. Right. Kocharian too, right? Kocharian too. Trying right? to something. Yeah. He is, unfortunately, what's happening in this uh, age of complete dismantlement of the Armenian society and Armenian psyche, I feel is that people are like oh yet another corrupt former president against our poor nikol pashinyan yeah. uh friends no understand what's happening this is a guy that birthed nikol pashinyan saying oh oh what did i do that's literally what's happening okay um yeah so you don't want to listen to him that's fine but uh it's definitely a telltale sign that even a man who nikol started with wants nothing to do with him and as a matter of fact is saying that he's worse than any threat yeah. that the Azeris and the Turks are launching at us. Greg, could you give just a real quick background what you mean by Nicole started with Levon? Uh, well, in, in 2008 and, uh, and, and, and uh, there was kind of a, you know, there was, a, there was kind of, there were, there were protests, right? And there was a campaign of Levon Ter Petrosan trying to come back against Ser Sarkisian. When Robert Kocharan was leaving, Ser Sarkisian was coming in, right? And then there was a kind of a push for Levonter Petrosian to yet again come back. Don't forget, Levonter Petrosian did not leave office. He was ousted. Then there was that horrendous, uh, uh, what do you call it, assassination of uh, Vazgen Sarkisian and uh, uh, soon to be, I believe, President uh, Demirjan. Um, the that led to essentially a whole era of calamity. Robert Kocharan came and essentially nobody accredit, credits him for that, but kind of pieced the country back together not allowing it to like spill into any kind of a civil war. Uh, fast forward to 2008, 
Leventor Del Petrosian again is trying to make another run for it in terms of you know pushing up against uh, Ser Sarkisian and one of his operatives, political operatives, was none other than Nikol Pashinyan. After that debacle all happened and the horrendous uh, you know incidents of the early March of 2008, uh, Nikol Pashinyan went into hiding for months and months on end. Um, within Armenia, but it's easy to do that. You go into a village, you know, bribe a few people or whatever, and you just sit there, kind of like what he did after the war. Remember, everybody, the proud the and prideful Nikol yeah. Pashinyan. He did not come out of a bunker for a week, uh, going on a week, I think. Anyways, that, that uh, did I answer? Yeah, no your one question? knew where he was. No one knew where he was. Yeah, no one knew where he was. Prime minister of a country, but it's okay. People, people like to argue me that I'm a little too harsh. Um, did that answer your question, Rich, David? Does that does that give yeah, you so that I was kind so. of like he's coming out, and then There's... obviously he kind of went astray. He left. He kind of left the LTP, as they call him, LTP, uh, which is Levon Petrosian's uh, political realm, and then started going off on his own. Um, then the Sasnatsir incident happened, and that was kind of his rallying cry. But even Sasnatsir, if you notice, as radical and interesting they are. Um, they didn't want nothing to do with him, but he is a person that likes to utilize situations all the time. And yeah. he definitely thrusted himself into the national uh, yeah. uh, forefront as a guy that's bringing cookies and uh, 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 care packages to Sasna Tzeres as they were held up in the, uh, in the police prison. Yep, and, and that's when we started this podcast, 2016. Yeah, that's when, when, yeah, David and I started this. Sorry, guys, we're way over our time limit, but it's I okay. feel that those that are interested want to be interested in understanding the nuances oftentimes the diaspora is caught off guard not knowing these little intricate details so that is the beginning the political beginning of Nikol Pashinyan and now the guy that brought him into it is saying oh boy this is like the darkest of the dark times that's it um yeah um, okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um pivot to uh the virtual auction yep and next week we have the chairman of the, the san francisco bay area arts Talk task force armin der Kriegian. he's a former president of the american university of armenia uh, he's also a professor from uc berkeley we're fortunate to have him on the show next week he's gonna be talking about the task force about the upcoming auction and rich sorry it's the the first post that's there um that has the flyer for the auction uh there it is right there perfect uh so this this auction is coming up first ever uh, for our community but it's online so it's for everybody anywhere in the world if you're able to join at that time 6 45 p.m pacific time it's going to be a virtual auction raising money for the soldiers in armenia so it's for the insurance foundation for servicemen uh which is it's not the Arme armenian wounded heroes it's something that is providing also providing funding a compensation directly to soldiers families fallen and injured soldiers families in armenia uh, so from the war in Artsakh and beyond um so uh encouraging everybody to take part in this and register we can show i'll share the link on the feed uh, but next week armin will join us to talk about that as well as the task force and as well as his experience with education in Armenia as a president of the AUA. And you guys, we both, have, we've all reported on the troubling changes to education system in Armenia or the proposed changes. So we'll touch on some of those things as well next week. Yeah, there's a, there's a touch of irony in that, in for me at least, that, you know, that as Armenia is trying to normalize its or diminish its own history, people like us have been fighting to to get the Armenian genocide to be promoted in in the history here, that people will learn about it. So on one hand, you've got the diaspora who's pushing for, you know, and we and we got we actually got a bill passed here in California to to get it into the curriculum. Right. And then yet they want to change the curriculum over there to act like, you know, I don't know what they're trying to do, but yeah, it it's makes no certainly sense. not promote Armenianism. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Uh, the other thing, guys, encourage we all encourage everybody to take action. They're the top of the mind, top the first thing right now is section 907. We may not be able to change it at all, but you can at least take some kind of action. Follow the ANCA's link, as well as Armenian Assembly. They both have links to contact your representatives uh, to ask for that to not be waived. 
Again, we may have may, may not we may not have any impact on that. It's the Department of Defense. I think that's controlling the president. They Absolutely. let him say the genocide, but they're controlling him, saying you're not getting rid of this. That's my opinion, but we could still take action through our representatives. So definitely do that. And of course, the POWs guys. There's still only 44 co-sponsors on the the House Resolution 240 calling for the release of prisoners of war. Europe has 120 members of parliament calling for it. We only have 44 out of 435 representatives that are signed on. We have to do more. It's not okay. Um, anyway, take action, take action, follow our link tree and do it. Yeah, if you, if you don't take anything away from this entire night's presentation, uh, in terms of links, I would say get, get the link tree so you'll have the master to everything. Yeah. You'll be able to click on that and you'll yeah. be able to take action from there. Uh, I know everybody has a life. I know everybody has a lot going on. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, you spending some time tonight with us or even watching this uh, when it's not live shows your commitment to the nation, just like we have it. So, you know, the reason that we're encouraging you to do this is because it, it actually does help. Uh, your activity will help move the needle. That's really what we're all trying to do. Uh, so exactly. that said, we are grateful to be back on Thursdays. This is a great way to usher in the weekend and sort of wrap up a lot of the news from the week. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I like doing th Thursdays because it does give us um, a little bit extra breathing room throughout the week, and it helps it to uh, close into the weekend a little bit nicely, at least for me. Um, look for some new changes coming up uh, in Odd Ocean Media. We're, we're going to be doing a lot more um, all the way around. I don't even want to spoil it. So. Um, so Thursdays, uh, 9, 9 p.m., and we also have, uh, this is going to be on YouTube as well, so please uh, subscribe to us on our YouTube channel uh, because we're going to need that, and we're going to be doing a little bit more than just being on Facebook, and so we're really going to need your support there. Exactly. Greg, you were, you were going to say something? Yeah, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, kind of end on, the, on, a, on a positive note, shall we say, uh, uh, and uh, this is something that you don't have on the link up. Don't worry about it. Yet another country uh, adopted the genocide resolution. Yes, Thank you, Latvia. Latvia. Latvia did, yeah. One, yeah. one of the Baltic states. Or Lithuania. I forget. Sorry. It was Latvia, Latvia, for sure. Latvia. 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 Thanks, thanks, Greg. Yeah, uh, missed that link. Yeah, yeah no, it's okay. Well, it's, uh, we don't need to put it up. Uh, but just you know, yet another nation kind of uh, joins the right side of the truth. Obviously, Turkey does the whole, like, no, 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 no. And Azerbaijan, bark, 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 bark. But it's a little too late. So appreciate Latvia. Beautiful capital, Riga. Interesting place. Um, you know, and that'll probably reverberate throughout the Scandinavian nations, as well as its two cousins to the north and south, Estonia and Lithuania. So thank you. All right. See you thank soon. You, Latvia. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks see for you watching. Next week, 9 p.m. All right. Good night, guys.